Okay, how do we understand these words? Baruch Atah Hashem. Who wants to go first? Blessed are you. Blessed are you, Hashem. Pretty simple, right? What does it mean, blessed are you, Hashem? Just start with the word blessed. What does that mean, blessed? What does that mean? Holy. Holy. Okay. Honored. 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 Fortunate. Fortunate. Okay. Um, to me, it means it's very unusual that I could actually have the power to bless something greater than myself, God. Why? Why is that unusual? Uh, because, I mean, I've learned other things on this, but like, the, like that's that doesn't exist. I don't even know if that exists outside of Judaism. That the power that God cares if man blesses God, like it's like I'm giving God a bracha, sort of. I'm blessing God. I'm, I'm giving something to God. Why should that? Well, like, how can you possibly do that? Now, the truth is that every bracha, every blessing, and. <clears throat> And Judaism starts with these words, Baruch Atah Hashem. We say it many, many times a day. Many times in the Shemona Esrei, many times not in the Shemona Esrei. And it really pays to think about what in the world. I mean, it's a very problematic phrase. It's a very problematic phrase. This should be very troubling. And we say it a lot. So I have a friend who at a certain point was on his journey into Judaism. And he was puzzled by certain certain occurrences in the Torah um, that, for example, you find in the Torah people saying, you know, Baruch Hashem, right? Blessed is Hashem. And how did they, how did they do that, my friend? Wanted to know. How can you bless God? How do you bless God? Now, the problem comes from this. What is a blessing? What does it mean, a blessing? Something is blessed. So a blessing, what it means is an increase in something, right? Like a blessing in the bread. It's like there's a more abundance of it. A blessing is it is an abundance or an increase, right? So when we say that something should be blessed, we mean that it should be increased. It should be uh, uh, enhanced in some way, right? So how do we how do we understand that when we apply it to God as an infinite being? Right? There's nothing lacking in God that he can be increased in any way because an increase implies some absence. Right? So, but we say this all the time. It's very problematic. So my friend said, how could it be that you have people in the Tanakh who are saying, you know, Baruch uh, Hashem, you know, blessed be God. That yeah, God should somehow be increased. So he came to an interesting conclusion He said, well, the people that we find doing this are not Jews. Noah says it. Malki Tzedek says it. He's the king of Shalem in Canaan. Eliezer, the servant of Avraham, says it. So it's, you know, he's like, so they didn't understand the concept of the infinity of God. They were working from a sort of uh, pagan mentality that gods are limited. There's many gods that each have their domain and they kind of vie with one another and so one can be increased over the other. And that's, you know, that's why they could say, oh, God, this God, the God of Abraham, should, should uh, somehow be, be more abundant or increased. But from a Jewish perspective, can't say such a thing because we know he's infinite. So he said it was just a mistake, right, <laughs> that they said this. So the problem with that is he, they're not the only ones who say it. Jews also say it. David HaMelech also says it a lot. Uh, many times in Tehillim. And the rabbis incorporated this phraseology into our tefillah everywhere. Baruch atah Hashem. So that is tonight's question. How in the world can we bless God? Yeah? By doing His will. How does that bless God? Well, it makes Him happy that we are following His and that he feels he's getting through to us. So you're saying that pleasing God is blessing God? Not really, but I can't think of anything else. <laughs> That's fine. I appreciate you trying. Okay, uh, we, heard you. Honoring, we heard you. What's that? When you say something, you're honoring, you're doing something in the honor. So you're increasing God's honor? Um, 
you're honoring him by doing something that's good. Like, that, what puzzles me from the, what you're talking about is like when something happens, uh, somebody got a new job, Baruch Hashem. That's what people say about everything. Right? Oh, he right. got a new house, Baruch Hashem. So, so and if you, when people say that in English, right, they go, oh, thank God. Praise the Lord, right? So, but it doesn't mean thank and it doesn't mean praise. So it's, it's a little bit of a misapplication. The question is, what do we mean when we say Baruch Hashem? Yeah. That we're making him significant in our lives. We're making him significant. So you say relative to ourselves, yeah. what was our relationship with Hashem before should be increased. Yeah, we're hoping to increase his importance to our, uh, okay. to our lives. Okay, that's good. I think you're saying good. I like that. Anybody, anybody else? Thank you, Yitzchak. Huh? I like Yitzchak's idea. I mean, the whole act of tefillah requires an audacity. I mean, we already said that, that we would even approach. So, by what right do we approach? So we have to think about that. Where do we have the right to approach? Okay, great. We begin with a blessing. So, I, th I thought about this, by the way, this point that was brought up. Um... So it's what's interesting is that we find that we find that if we read Bereshus, you know, there's famously there's like two creation accounts and they don't exactly correspond perfectly with one another. And uh, so in the in the first one we find that Hashem creates the vegetation on the third day, but then later it says that after man was created there was there was uh, there was nothing, you know, and then. Uh, he had to do something to make the vegetation sprout. And so the so Rashi says like it was all, Hashem created, it was all like under the surface waiting to come out. And what Hashem was waiting for is waiting for Adam to daven. He had to daven, he had to pray. And then that caused everything to come out. But it was all made, it was just waiting to come out, right? So there is, Hashem creates the world in an incomplete state. And he wants us to, our purpose is to partner with Hashem and create. That's a very famous, very fundamental idea. We say it in the Kiddush that Hashem created the world. Shabara uh, Hashem uh, it says um, that Hashem created La'asos, the last word in the Kiddush. He created to make. We were talking about Hashem created the world. He created La'asos. He created the world La'asos to do, to make. The world is not complete. The world was created with leftover for us to complete. That's our job, and I, I spoke about this in the previous uh, class, or two classes, I remember the idea of that man has created B'Tselem Elohim, he's made a, a image of God, Elohim is the name that is used throughout the creation account, and man is, is, hi Mahadir, man is, there's a sign issue, man is made with this name, Tselem Elohim, he's made with the name of creation, the name which brings things into creation, so we are very much partners with Hashem in the creation, that's our essence. So the, the, the nerve to approach is, is twofold, is number one, because Hashem wants us to ask of Him in order to bring into the world, to bring into the world the blessing, to bring into the world the abundance. Um, because we are His partner, and also as we've spoken about before, that Hashem wants to have a relationship with us which is very much the essence of the first bracha. So if you look just above the first line, the, above the Baruch Hashem, you see that the art school has put in there a word that has no vowels, because it's not meant to be read, it's just meant to be noticed. What is the word there? Without vowels? Avot. Avos, which means? Fathers. The first blessing is called Avos. It's the title of the blessing. It's the blessing of fathers. We begin our tefillah with a reference to the forefathers. Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, we spoke about also in previous class, then Ishir Hashirim, which is all about the relationship. Really, the, the first historical event that we hear about in Ishir Hashirim, the earliest, I should say, chronologically, that we're going to hear about in Ishir Hashirim is the forefathers. It's the beginning of this incredible, incredible relationship. And all that is in this bracha, and it's really, really incredible, so I want to get through it. So I'm going to tell you a couple of approaches to the word baruch. I think that they do relate to some of the things that's said here, but we're going to go a little deeper, okay? Okay. 
one of the approaches is basically to say, of course you can't bless God. Of course you can't cause God to have any increase whatsoever. Baruch isn't a request for an increase. Baruch is an acknowledgement that all blessing, all abundance, all um, uh, anything that comes into the world, all of creation emanates from Hashem. So when you say Baruch Ata Hashem, what you're really saying is that the the Baruch, the, the the essence of blessing, of increase, of something coming into being that wasn't there before, that is from you. Another way of saying it is, you Hashem are the source of everything. That is one of the approaches to Baruch Ata Hashem, is acknowledging immediately that Hashem is the source of everything. We have an immediate acknowledgement because we're going to be asking and uh, this is come, goes back to something we said earlier as well. I care. Is that in order to ask, you have to acknowledge, you have to understand who you're asking from, and that this is this is the source. This is where you want something, you need something. Where you're going to get it, you have to understand where it's coming from. So that's one approach. Is Baruch Atah Hashem, you are the source of everything. But there is an even more radical approach, which is this. Ready? I'm going to tell you something deep, and if. It's, if you can't handle it, I apologize in advance. <laughs> there are different names of Hashem. The highest name that we use is this name, which is spelled Yud, and then Hey, and then Vav, and then Hey. We don't even pronounce it the way it's spelled. It's so holy, but we have a placeholder for it. We use the term Ado, and then the syllable Nai, which essentially means Lord, but what we are thinking about when we're saying that is these letters, which are, it's a contraction of three Hebrew words. Haya, which means was or past. Hove, which means is or present. And Yihye, will be or future. That all of everything that exists now and before and forever all emanates from God. It's the name from which creation emanates. As opposed to, when we get to Elokeinu, the next name, which means, we translate it as God, it really means powerful being. It means an actor within the world. Now we're talking within the world. That there are powers that exist in the world, and God is the master of those powers. He's the source of those powers. But all the other names, we... Not only do we pronounce them the way they're spelled, they have that lower quality to them, whereas the first name, the Yud name, we don't even pronounce it the way it's spelled. But also, all those other names have applications that are not holy. Because the word Elohim in, in, uh, in the Torah sometimes can refer to Elohim Acherim, other powers, or, or, or what's called other gods, or other powers. Or you have Elohim meaning judges, which are powerful beings on earth, people that have the power over others. So they have a mundane meeting, but we apply them to God where it's appropriate. The Yud name is uniquely applied to God only. And yet, and yet, with all that said, it's a little funny to say or to think that God has a name. Right? Because, like, how do you get your name? Your mommy and your daddy give you your name. But before you had your name, were you different than you were after you had your name? Or just, we just didn't know what to call you yet. But essentially, what, you're, what you are before the naming and after the naming is not changed. It's just, now I know what to call you. Right? And there are deep, there are deep things to say about the name being a description of the soul. And and it's a, and it's a, it, your name is perhaps your essence, but we have to say and you could you're free to feel free to disagree with me over here. But what I'm telling you comes from a sefer called Nefesh Chaim, which I showed you last week. He says there God is so infinite and beyond our grasp that you can apply a name to him, but the name does not define him. The name is not him. He is something indescribable, untouchable, um, 
completely unlimited, right? It's what they call in Kabbalah, they call it the Ein Sof. The Ein Sof, which means without end, or in, infinite, or infinity. But he says that even Ein Sof is not an accurate name for God. It's just, it's just that it's the best we can do. Because really, he's not Ein Sof, he's not without an end. He's Ein Rashis, he's without a beginning. But what we mean when we say ain't self is there's that understanding of it is beyond my ability. I can begin to understand Hashem, but I can never completely understand Hashem. So vis-a-vis myself, Hashem is an ain't self. There's, there, it's beyond reach. But the truth is that even that name, he says, is not accurate because he's also an ain't racist. There's no beginning and there's no end. There's absolutely no limitation whatsoever. So he says... This name of Hashem is the highest name. It's essentially, it's the name where God begins to create the world. So that before the creation of the world, when there's just God, there are no names. There's, no, there's, there, there's, there's nothing to talk about. There's just the infinity of Hashem. But then there's a beginning of a creation. There's something new that's happening over here. And so that access point, that doorway between what's absolutely infinite and what begins to become finite, what begins to come into existence, that is this name. This name is just the description of that access point between infinity and finite, between infinite and finite. That's, that's the doorway. But beyond this name, there's something that's beyond that name. Yeah? Just to, just to highlight what I understand you're saying is that beginning of that name creates three dimensions that we can be aware of. Basically, only the past, the present, and the future. So that name goes from that space into three other dimensionalities of what we can only exist in. And that's it. Right? Because we can't, we can't only, we can only just be in the past. Or we can only be in so, the present. So, yes. We, we right. We, we will exist within the limitations that are created right. by this name, which we are completely limited by time. Right. What's interesting is like in space, we can move forward, backwards, up, down, left, right. But in time, we can never, we have no control. We're just hurtling without any, we're, we are confined by this name, but God is not confined by the name. So, and he brings that reality into existence. So what we're saying is, what we're saying is, Baruch Atah Hashem, we're reaching for this access point, between the finite and the infinite, and we're saying, God, come in. Come in. We want more of you in here. The world is a finite place, but the more that that doorway is open, the more we connect to it, connect to the infinity, the more expanded and increased our lives become. So, what do I mean by that? I don't know if I know what I mean by it, but I'm going to give you an example. I'm going to give you an example. We're going to see there's 18 brachas, 19 brachas in Shemona Esrei. What all of them are describing and what all of them are reaching for and what all of them are asking for is an ideal state. Is an ideal state. We want the world to come to perfection. So you see throughout the brachas that that's basically what we're describing is what we want in these 18 areas. We want the world to come to perfection. The only thing that is perfection is Hashem Himself in His essence. The more blocked off that essence is from our world, the more uh, decrepit and dilapidated and uh, lowered the world becomes. And the more access we have to that infinity, the more the increase and the more it's uplifted and the more it's brought towards perfection, towards uh towards God, towards God's will, right? So what we're doing is we are reaching and we, okay, so the, 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 the Nefesh HaChaim says that really everything, this goes back to what you said, everything that Hashem has commanded us to do is for that purpose, is for that purpose. Every mitzvah should be done, ideally, with the kavana that Hashem, I am doing this in order to, to bring your will to bring your will into fruition. I want to bring the world to... No, Hashem created the world. Let's go back. Let's rewind. Hashem created the world. What for? What for? For what purpose? For what purpose? What did Hashem create the world for? 
Okay? Very, very important. For what purpose? Anybody know? I feel like to share it. To bestow goodness. How do you know that? Because we say that God is goodness. He's only good. Okay. So, and he is looking for a way to use that goodness to bestow it on something. So, I hear what you're saying, but I'm going to challenge you because, because that is to say that somehow God was lacking before he created the world. And only through the creation of the world he could fulfill this lack of bestowing goodness. Because he had all this goodness to give and nobody to give it to. So, he just, you know, he was out of luck until he figured out he could create a world and bestow goodness on it. So, I, I'm not comfortable with that. Mm. So... I'll agree with the, with, with the statement that God created the world in order to bestow goodness. The question is, how do we know that? And I don't mean just because it says so in the book, famous, famously stated in the Selsi Sharim by the Ramchal, and many others. He's not the only one who was the first guy to roll along and say that. It's in the Shla as well. And it really emanates from all the, the deeper Sfarim. But here's the deal. As we have no idea before the world was created why God decided to do it. But once the world was created, we have no choice other than to conclude and to understand that it was done for our benefit. Because once we acknowledge that there's an existence of an infinite being who can take for himself nothing and can only, can only share of his own infinity unto others, and we are the others, by, by force, the only, essentially the, the, the only relationship that can exist between a finite being and an infinite being is that the infinite is bestowing upon the finite. That's just, that's the way things are flowing. There really isn't any other way. Um, because God's infinite. What can he take? What can we give him? And he says it many times. What could you possibly give me? So why he decided to do it, we can't possibly know. It's be totally beyond us. But now that it's done, here we are. So the only conclusion is the purpose of this part, this, this part of the equation, it's done. Why? Well, I know that why I'm here is because God wants to give me something incredible. Because he's got it all and I need it all. And that's the relationship. So Hashem says, here's how you do it. Here's how you do it. And this is a deep topic that I don't want to spend the whole time on. But he says here, here's a Torah, 613 mitzvahs. Here's how you get it. Okay? And when you do this, you're bringing the world to a state of perfection in which all of us will have a great time. We're all going to be very, very happy. It's going to be good for you because that's what I want. I just, here's how you do it. Here's how you do it. You're going to ask me why couldn't God just do it automatically and I'll, and I'll answer you. Right? <laughs> That's a good question. I'll answer you because a, 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 um, something, something given is not valued as something earned. Meaning, if God means to bestow the ultimate pleasure, and that's the, that's the, the language that's used, amiti, the ultimate pleasure, if God means to bestow the ultimate pleasure, and he says, here, it automatically loses value because something given is not valued as something earned. When a person puts his own effort into something and receives it in return, that item becomes more beloved to them. So the pleasure automatically has to be earned in order to be enjoyed, enjoyed to the highest level. Then you ask me, yeah, but that's only because God created man's nature that way. But if God hadn't created man's nature that way, then he could have enjoyed it without being given it. And then, you, then, you, then, you, then you're going to get into the next. I don't know if you want me to go there or not. Is anyone thinking that? Does anyone yeah. want me to go there? Okay, you want me to go there? Okay, here's why. Because since God is the source of everything, and God, and as Dr. Teich told us, so that source, that's the source of all good. All the goodness is coming from there. The closer you get to that source, the, the, what I'm going to tell you is so deep that if you get it, it was worth coming, okay? The closer you get to that <laughs> source, the did? more <laughs> goodness and pleasure and enjoyment you experience because those two are essentially synonymous. The experience of God himself is that good, is that pleasure. So the closer you get, the more... Now, what does it mean close? When we're talking about a being that has no corporeality 
and has no takes up no space, so to speak, you can't get closer in a physical sense. The only way you get closer is in what we call, when we so talk about closeness, and it, it's nice that it works out in English this way as well, it's not a coincidence, we mean likeness. We mean likeness. So for example, when I say, what number is closer to one, two or three? Okay, so the, right, what's the answer? Two. Two. two is closer to one than three is because it's only removed by a factor of one. But I'm not a mathematician. But what do you mean close? These are con- numbers or concepts. I could draw it on, a, on a, I could draw a number line and then I could make it physical, but essentially numbers are conceptual. But when we mean closeness, we mean likeness. When we talk about something non corporeal, closeness is likeness. So closeness to God means likeness to God. And since God is only, by essence, a giver, in order to be like God, you have to be a giver. giver. And the more you are a taker, the less like God you are. So therefore, it is required of us in order to reach that state of likeness to God in which we can feel the ultimate pleasure, is we have to be acting, we have to be building, we have to be working, we have to be giving. We cannot just be like, lay it on me, God, I'm ready, right? That automatically pulls you away, that automatically reduces the closeness, it reduces the pleasure intrinsically, intrinsically. So the intrinsic pleasure is the likeness to God, is the closeness to God, which is by emulating God, by being God-like. And God says, here's how you do it. Here's how you do it. So we have a Torah every mitzvah. It says the Nefesh Chaim, coming back, says the Nefesh Chaim, every mitzvah should be done with the intent. I'm doing this for you, God, not for me, even though it will benefit me. But the intent shouldn't be, I'm doing this for my benefit is I'm doing this because I want to bring the world to the goal state, the state of perfection, which was God's intent and desire in creating the world. So by us having sort of an altruistic, if you will, an altruistic intent in performing the mitzvah, that is, I'm not doing it for me, I'm doing it for God. I said I can't do anything for God. It's true, but God created, but that's true. But God created the world, and once it's created, we know that it was for the benefit of the world. So I know that God's intent in creating the world is benefit of the world. So I'm going to do God's will. My intent is to, what's the greatest? I'm going to bring God into the world. I'm going to uplift the world. I'm going to bless the world. Avraham is told, we're going to go back to Avraham. Avraham is told, you will be a blessing. Through you, through you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. We are the, we are going to be the blessing. We're going to be the conduit for, we're going to bring God into the world. We're going to uplift the world. We're going to bless the world. Bring God into it. How do we do it? The mitzvahs. And among those things is tefillah. And therefore, maybe not even, maybe especially tefillah. Because tefillah takes the place of the korban. And the korban, oh, it goes so deep. The korban was like the food of the universe. There's a body and there's a soul. Are you with me, everybody? Or did I lose you all? There's a body and there's a soul. I'm telling you, never There's a body and there's a soul. These things should have nothing to do with each other because the body is physical and the soul is spiritual. One is material and one is completely non-material. How do these things have anything to do with each other? I don't know, but I do know that they do, they do connect. And what's interesting is we find that if I, that in, I have to, I have to act in a physical way. I have to acknowledge my body and I have to feed my body in order for my soul to remain attached to it. In order for my soul to act in the world, I have to keep my body intact. And the main way that we do that is by eating. So we take in food and somehow this food attaches the body and the soul. Like if I wouldn't eat, suddenly I'd feel lightheaded and then I would pass out soon enough I would die, right? So the food somehow... The food is attaching the body and soul, allows the soul to inhabit the body and act and do good and bring good into the world or bad. The deeper sources tell us that the universe is the body. You ready? The universe is the body and God is the soul. Meaning the relationship between the created universe and the creator 
is the analogous to the relationship between the body and the soul. The soul imbues the body with life. You're alive. You're a body, but you have life in you. You have a soul that's in you and allows you to choose and to do and to act and to create, to destroy. God is the soul of the universe. So just like the food is this attachment, so the korbanos were that. The korbanos were that. We, in the mikdash we went and we brought... We brought this attachment, or we maintained this attachment between God and the world through the korbanas. It was like the food of the universe. So the tefillah is the korban, right? The tefillahs are in place of korban. Neshama param svasenu. My mouth will pay, will 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 fill in for bowls. So, and here especially the work of the avoda of tefillah, the work of the tefillah is to attach the Hashem to the world. Baruch Ata Hashem. You Hashem, that attachment, that name, that attachment between between the spiritual and the physical, between God and the created world. Baruch, I want to increase that attachment. I want to bring more of that soul into this body that is the world. I want it to, to increase. I want it to reach a level of perfection. And we are all actors on that mission. And that is, this is like the mission statement. Baruch Atah Hashem. Okay? And that's how we start out the tefillah. 